Mother. Man. Gerard Schaefer here. I was just talking to my buddy out of school with Ted Bundy, and they said we should check out the new murder metal band. Spreading faster than a case of the clap in a trailer court. Able to shatter eardrums within a 666-mile radius. A podcast more brutal than all the rest. It's Murder Metal What the hell's going on, man? What the fuck's up, motherfucker? Got Gerard Schaefer doing some promo for us there, Chris. <laughs> Hell yeah. It is Tuesday. We're throwing down here a new Murder Metal Mayhem. We're in Horns High Studios for the Horns High Podcast Network. Episode 189, gentlemen, going down tonight. Chris, Joey, how the hell is everybody doing, man? I'd be doing better if this fucking gnat wasn't flying around my face. Yeah, yeah. I see you swatting at something. I didn't know what the hell was. I didn't know if you were just really hammered and just seeing God shit. Damn, like... <laughs> Very cool. And Joey, you all settled in over there at the 419 yet? Yeah, we're uh, we're here, 419 Studios, fucking recording for the Murder Mel Mayhem episode. Uh, pretty cool. Awesome. Seems like it's going pretty well so far. Yeah, last week, Joey, your first time recording yourself, you and Tex both, and so we really, we took a stab at something we've never done with two different, you know, re remotes, and you guys killed it, man. The audio turned out really good, so. Hell yeah. The listeners get to hear it as if you're, like, right here in Horn's Eye, and with the with the aid of Zoom, we're able to look at each other when we talk, which is a lot easier. Um, and yep. we seem to like that. And so that's really cool. And we're tonight we're going to be doing something different, guys. We're going to record the murder segment on video. Hell, so you get yeah. to see us talking like you know you see it on Zoom with us Brady Bunch style. Uh, me and Chris <laughs> on one camera and Joey on the other, and. So it's going to be really fun tonight. We're going to do that for the first time. So so that's awesome. All right. Uh, what T-shirts we got going on here tonight? Chris, what what you... I got a fucking Killgasm shirt on. Fuck yeah, dude. Very nice. Yeah. Fucking another, cool. another one fucking Joey gave me. Got Killgasm. <laughs> where, where's Killgasm from? Where are they from, dude? Uh, West Coast up in the Bay Area of California. Yeah. Nice. Nice. A lot of great bands from over there. Joey, I already know what that shirt oh, is. Oh, I know but, what that shirt is. But why don't you tell our listeners that don't have the the, the advantage of seeing the top line of that shirt. <laughs> I'm wearing a Lividity shirt, and it says, Fuck it's yeah. not about Satan, it's about pussy. Hell yeah. And yeah. One of my favorite shirts of all time. Uh, I also got the fucking amputated genitals hat. I uh, just went and saw them at <clears throat> Chicago Domination Fest, but also... Uh, Daniel, who's in the band, he puts on uh, a bunch of Death Fest down in Columbia. And fucking, he just brought Lividity, was just there down there. Yeah, I pile. seen that. That's yeah. cool. Yeah. So he's the one that does that. So repping amputated genitals tonight, too. Fuck yeah, man. Nothing like repping some amputated genitals. <laughs> <laughs> Castration. <laughs> Very cool. I got to tell you, Joey, I have a doctor at the VA that uh is into true crime and he yeah. says uh oh yeah you know i wound up getting on the subject that i do a podcast and he's like what's it called you know and i told him and uh you know he i said hey you know the language can be a little rough you know it may not be for you <laughs> you know and he's like oh no no i've i've heard it all you know and so i saw him today on a video or yesterday on a video appointment and he says, oh, I checked out Murder Metal Mayhem. And I said, oh, well, that's good that you're here. Like, you didn't run away. Or, right, right. You know, and I said, which one did you listen to? And he said, oh, it was one about the guy from Connecticut. And he's trying to remember the name. He goes, he drove around in a van. And he goes, Sick <laughs> Ripper. He said Sick yeah. Ripper. The doctor yeah. did. But I told that's Chris awesome. it, was, it was awesome. But the only thing that would have been cooler is if he did it. Like you would say, <laughs> yeah, in the voice <laughs> with the guitar, even in the background, would have even just yeah. been the ultimate, you know. That's hilarious. so yeah. So that was funny though. But the doctor, an MD, said sick ripper, 
And that's how he remembered it. But he said it was hilarious. He said, I listen to true crime podcasts all the time. He goes, I've never heard anything like that. <laughs> he goes, that was like a three ring circus with you guys. So that, that was pretty cool. That's awesome. So what a compliment. That's a good compliment. It's like, yeah. it's like a three ring circus, you know. <laughs> all right. Well, Vren, there's three of us. So I guess why not be a three ring circus? All right. Fuck yeah. All right. Well, very, very cool. And of course, I've got. Uh, my Carl Panzram shirt on tonight. Sure. Hell yeah. um, I just felt like it, you know, no real reason. I know we talked about him here. It was last week or the, or the week before and no real reason. I was working from home today, but I thought, you know what the hell? I'm just doing some Carl Panzram. So hell yeah. I'm trying to decide I don't, I, my I shirt. I don't think there's ever a bad time t- for you to wear Carl Panzram. <laughs> that, that, that's true. I mean, really. Um, <laughs> The uh, the the shirt selection for the convention, the both days, is kind of like going to a concert and wanting to pick just the right shirt. To wear. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. I'm torn, man. I'm torn, but I'm leaning toward at least one day, Ricky Casso. That's fucking that's right, a great dude. Shirt. Yeah. Got to the ass. That would be a good one because people would be like, "Oh shit!" If they recognize that, then they're definitely a true crime fan. Right. So, very cool. All right, well, um, last week, guys, we did our episode on the wild-ass case of Robert Stroud, the Birdman of Alcatraz, and we had Tex on with us for that one, which was awesome. Uh, learned some cool things, what a prison wallet was. You know, that was interesting. <laughs> <laughs> that was fucked up. And uh, Tex was just in rare form last week, but that was a good one. And the discussion about the two murders that he committed, um, because, you know, everybody knows him as the Birdman of Alcatraz, but, you know, sometimes people don't realize that dude, like, killed two people. Uh, 43 years, though, a solitary confinement. Goddamn, dude. Yeah, and his his obsession with the birds and all of that. Covered in shit. Covered (laughs) in bird shit and piss, and it was a fucking disgusting yet invigorating episode. So (laughs) that would be another good, you know, comment like reviews you know you know disgusting and invigorating right (laughs) uh murder metal mayhem uh chris did the feature of the metal segment chris on a band you picked yeah shadow women fucking tent hell yeah yeah. hartford connecticut band yes sir and that was cool and we did a kid killer cage match and uh chris had a little mayhem for us fucking vehicular chaos (laughs) very much very much and it's still continuing it's still continuing it's still going on but uh, and on, also, on a side note, uh, the rear end did not go out on Dad's truck. Oh, he thought that's, the axle oh, fell nice. out the rear end. No, the fucking wheel just fell off the motherfucker. Oh shit! <laughs> <laughs> well, that's uh, that's no good. But it's better than a rear end. Yeah, that's yeah, for sure. So, all right. Well, uh, you know that was definitely a good one. So if you missed it, go on and check it out. Uh, we also had that piece of that Rick Fisher interview. And that episode, uh, the the episode 189, or I'm sorry, 188, was um, passing 800 listens to that today. Rick Fisher! (laughs) Right? (laughs) Yeah, we need to ask him if we could do that. Um, And then the Rick Fisher bonus episode with the full interview was passing 500 listens to that today. So, very cool. And also we did that on our YouTube channel the video of that interview. So lots of good stuff last week. So if you missed any of it, you need to go back and check that out. All right. Now tonight, guys, we're getting sick. We're getting nasty. Chris, this is a pretty, pretty gruesome one. Fucking goddamn killer cops. Fuck. It's a good job to be able to get away with shit. That's for damn sure. We're talking Gerard Schaefer tonight, the killer cop, Joey. I know he's been one you've been wanting to do for a while. So that's cool. Yeah, Gerard Schaefer, like, and a lot of it's because of his pr- his prison interviews more than his case. Even he's right. just such a classic character to me, and uh, so yeah, I've been excited to do this one. He, yeah. He's a pompous asshole with a fucking just oh, a, such a, a dude. A, he's got. Th- He's got an awesome smile, but also that makes you want to punch him. Right. But, like, I love his mug shots. His his pictures and his smile is just too yeah. fucking hilarious. Yeah, he's cheesing it, man. He thinks he's the shit. Yeah. So, yeah, we're going to talk about that fucking fool tonight, so that should be good. 
And, uh, you know, his brutal crimes, I mean, against young women, tying them up, terrorizing, torturing, I mean, just gruesome horror show stuff, uh, 1972 and 73, so not, uh, you know, a long span, but they do suspect it could have gone into the 60s. Um, his confirmed count was only two, but they strongly think there were more like 28 based on all those mementos that he kept. So we'll talk about that. And what he said. And what he said, for sure. And the writing, Chris, again, another writing serial killer. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. Keeping, so uh, we got that, keeping the author theme going on here. Um, and we'll discuss stories. it in detail in the murder segment. And we're going to record the video of us doing that, as I mentioned. So that'll be fun. All right. And Joey, you got the horns tonight. And who have you decided to do in the metal feature tonight? Well, uh, since this is my first one over here in Ohio, um, I decided to do an Ohio band and one that's been around for a really long time. And that band is Embalmer from Cleveland, Ohio. Hell that's yeah. awesome. That's awesome. Uh, definitely going to be interested to hear this. I know of the band, but I don't know much about them. But I know they were in right, heavy right. core. And I know that uh, we played with them at the Central Illinois Metal Fest one time. So Hell yeah. they were amazing. A uh, really, really good band live. I was pretty blown away by it. So so I'm anxious to hear that. And Chris, you got a Lost Classic for I us got tonight? got something, yep. Good, good. And we'll do that in the metal segment. We've got another, another metal you know, icon died here this week. We're going to talk about that in the metal segment. Uh, I'm not sure... If you guys know about it, but uh, we'll, we'll get into that. Uh, killer cage match tonight, guys. That's when we have our listeners provide those random numbers where we decide who's going to fight in the cage and what they're going to be fighting with. And Chris, who are our listeners we want to say thank you to? Tonight we have Missy Hartson, Dan Jude, and Laura Kovacs. Awesome. So fucking right. Oh, yeah. Thank you very much, guys, for the random numbers. And then, Joey, who have they picked to fight huh. tonight? This is a good one, man. Maybe. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> these these dudes would definitely go have some lunch together. <laughs> for, for sure. sure. That's for sure, yeah. Uh, but uh, we're going to have fucking uh, Milwaukee cannibal Jeffrey Dahmer. And man, he's going to go up against a big old motherfucker oh, named boy. Joe Matheny. Ooh, God, damn. wow. Scary is an understatement yeah yeah that dude joe joe Matheny, that's an early episode of murder mail mayhem right there it Very is early. and as a matter of fact i had a letter partially written i don't normally write to serial killers or killers but i wanted to write to joe Matheny because we had done the episode right. and i was like man i just need to write to this dude and he died like in the middle of me writing the letter he died <laughs> i was like fuck well, there that goes sucks. my one, you know, that I thought would be kind of fun to write to, you know. But uh, anyway, Joe Let Matheny. Let him know talking about him at a wedding is what got us started doing a podcast. That's right. <laughs> that's right. So Joe Matheny and Jeffrey Dahmer going up in the cage tonight. And they got a couple of objects and a variable to make it fun. And, of course, we always do that in the Mayhem segment. So that'll be fun tonight. And uh, Sick Rick, guys, we talk about him. He's a sponsor of the show. But, man, what an amazing assortment. Dope-ass mask. Amazing stuff. The video interview uh, I thought turned out good because you get to see Rick in his lair. And he's talking Hell about yeah. how he makes the masks and all that. And then, Joey, this week we picked uh, Ted Bundy as our feature mask tonight. And that's a really good one that he's got. Um, you know, that we have here in the studio, but just really sick, uh, lifelike in the color. And, you know, J uh, Rick does them in zombie. We did the Gein one last week. Yeah. Um, you know, he'll do them in black and white. He'll do them in all these different assortments. And uh, fuck, yeah. The Bundy one looks very realistic. Uh, we have it in the lifelike paint job. So really cool stuff. So, yeah. So sick Rick masks dot com that's s-i-k-r-i-k masks.com and uh, if you want to get a mask that's the place to do it and he also does the uh, trick or treat the trick or treat masks so all the common like freddy krueger michael myers you know any of the 
a mass night of living dead he's got a right. ton of them he's been doing he's doing repaints, repaints. and shit and they, yeah. look, they look fucking amazing they really do so go to that website sickrickmass.com i'll link to it in the episode description all right uh speaking of rick fisher as i mentioned we got that full interview we did with him so go check that out um guys we got a big event coming up this weekend chris and i will be there you don't want to miss it uh if you're listening to this episode it's tomorrow is when it starts um it'll be friday august 19th that's 2022 in case you're listening to this like seven in years in the future <laughs> you show up on a monday night wonder where the fuck we are you know yeah right uh and saturday august 20th at the i hotel in champaign illinois and uh, joey i know you will not be there but we're gonna have you there in spirit and of course oh, yeah. we're bringing cck with us joey so fuck yeah yeah no, we're gonna got to bring cck for a little support maybe our listeners will want to take a picture next to cck which would be cool as shit so in yeah, his socks sure. right <laughs> <laughs> so yeah so we're going to bring cck with us so that'll be fun and uh so don't want to miss it we're going to have the fucking t-shirts we're going to have the activity books i got the shipment today I ordered more. I got them. Fucking right. So we oh, got yeah. those. I also needed some of my books, so I got all that stuff. I'm going to start packing. I got my list all prepared, so I hopefully don't forget anything. And we're going to be fucking pulling it all out. We got Brian Usual, the artist, is going to be there both days, so that'll be cool. Jeff Gaither's supposed to be there. Uh, Terrence Muncy, just some really great artists uh movie people directors writers uh there's like three or four other podcasters are going to be there so you definitely don't want to miss it uh and i'll link to it in the episode description if you need to get tickets because they're cheaper if you get them in advance right. oh i'm hearing sirens it must be in the 419 <laughs> 419 better watch out <laughs> well 419 fucking sirens replacing the 920 train right right, right. <laughs> although <laughs> To, to defend CK or to defend uh, Toledo, Danbury had its share of sirens. Yeah, oh, yeah, it definitely it did. Yeah. With CK, <laughs> but it fits more with the 419 theme going on here to have some cool sirens and shit. Yeah, yeah. Some junkyard dog barking in the background, you know, <laughs> something like that. Yeah. Um, all right. So thank you to everybody that's out there listening to Murder Metal Mayhem. We keep seeing the numbers. This week, guys, we're at about 2,600 listens, so right around last week. So thank you, Fucking those a. of you that are listening and telling other people about it. Like my doctor, now listening now your to doctor Murder Metal Man. He said so he doesn't doc, do you know, metal, thanks. but the true crime part, he's like, yeah, okay. Yeah, he said he wasn't into metal, so all he listened to is the true crime part. But that's okay. Um, that's cool. I think like 80-something percent of our listeners listen to almost all the show. Yeah, yeah. So the stats are pretty cool with that stuff. The real ones. That's right. All right, guys. Well, we got a lot on our plate tonight. We're going to be taking a little trip. We're going to be going to uh, the state of Florida. Yep. And we're going to be hopefully avoiding ending up on a fucking tree at the end of a noose. Don't so. want to be talking to no cops. So uh, let's go get on there. Fuck yeah, that was the band Cut Up and the song Cranium Crusher. You gotta love that. Those guys are sick as hell. Definitely digging on them, and we've played them before on here. Good the band. Name Cut Up. Fuck yeah, <laughs> cool band name. All right, well, tonight, guys, we're going to be doing the disturbing case of Gerard Schaefer, and that's the cop who killed young women and did it in a very sadistic way. Very much so. He also wrote about his crimes, um, but he did it like fiction. So he's trying to be slick like O.J. Um, claimed it was all made up. Yeah, none of it was true. But but the cops think, and I would agree, that uh, it was basically him reliving 
uh, the murders and, and, you know, writing it down to preserve it, kind of like Joe Naso with his murder list, you know. Uh, but he was a sick and twisted motherfucker, um, only convicted of two murders, uh, but the police believed it was more like 28. Uh, Schaefer, though, claims it could have been upwards of 100, but you know how that Plus goes. More. Yeah, like... Hard to say, can't right? believe everything they say, but... No. Dude, like was in different countries and shit right right so definitely makes you wonder but you know we'll never really know but we're going to do this one of course murder metal metal mayhem style and we're recording the video for our youtube channel tonight for the first time with the way we're doing this with the uh youtube or the uh zoom the zoom meeting thank you zoom. Chris. all i want to do is zoom zoom <laughs> <laughs> now chris you you heard about schaefer of course before we put him on the list but do you think our true crime fans are gonna are gonna know the name gerard schaefer i mean i think some will not everybody obviously but right not super well known i think there's quite a few out there that probably know who he is being that he was a fucking serial killing cop Right, right. And, you know, in the modern age, uh, but like we've talked about before, Joey, I know you've brought this up where, you know, you've got so many things going on that I don't know. I didn't look it up for these time period or the time period that this was happening. But in the 70s, you know, um, you know, Vietnam was going on. So, you know, could have been something like that, taking people's mind to you know different uh subject altogether but um definitely one i think that a lot of people don't know a lot about um but joey what do you think it is about these cops that do fucked up shit like this i mean what what is it does that make it worse that it's a cop or what do you think i mean pretty much because i mean this is somebody who's sworn their lives right to protect to protect people and do this and that. And not only that, as a cop, I'm sure he has, you know, busted people for certain shit, fucked their lives up or whatever. And the yeah. whole time he's a fucking hypocrite. Right. So as a human being, that's just a shitty thing, you know, but uh, these people are supposed to be, you know, people that uphold the law and right. are there for exactly. our, our service and, you know, then they do shit like that and then fucking people gain a mistrust for the situation you know that's true man i mean it's it's kind of like with the nurses we've talked about or the doctors that do shit like this it's just you put so much trust literally your life or in in some cases you know the future you're gonna be locked up in a prison you know because of something that this guy's gonna do that's gonna make you in the force you to be in that situation and Knowing that this dude's doing the shit he was doing uh, makes it just pretty shitty, uh, even worse than it already is. Um, yeah. Now, I stumbled on this one watching some YouTube stuff. Um, I had heard about a killer cop before, so I'm not 100% sure it was him or not. But once I watched the documentary, it seemed like oddly familiar. Um, but this one's going back into the 60s. Uh, in the 70s, you know, before you guys were born, and I was wearing, like, diapers, you know. So right. this is long <laughs> before our time here. But I think the hardcore fans are going to know Schaefer. Um, I bet a majority won't know a lot about him. And so I think we're probably going to educate some people tonight. But definitely a fucked-up case. And Murder Metal Mayhem definitely specializes in the fucked-up. The up. weird fucked-up <laughs> shit, right. yeah. Or like Mick said, you know, like he thinks that just sometimes people just need to hear like, damn, that's just fucked, you know. <laughs> yeah. Instead of some fancy, you know, scientific terms, you know, we just say it like it is, well, yeah, you know, in, in the plain English, you know. Um, and I've been watching these YouTube videos where like even the simplest words get blurted out like they're doing it themselves. They must be. But I was watching these videos and like simple words like kill or, you know, like blood, They're like important. they were blotting them out. And I'm like, well, if that's the standard, then we yeah, might as we, well just give up. Yeah, because we are not Because this whole that. show would be like nothing but a long, <laughs> beep, long yeah. you know. So, so we're not doing any of that. I mean, whatever. If they take it down, they take it down. I really don't give a shit, but I'm not doing that. 
All right. Uh, so Gerard Schaefer, born in Wisconsin in 1946. And, of course, we know a few Wisconsin killers, don't we, gentlemen? Yes, sir. Gein, Dahmer. Hell, yeah. Uh, some good ones for sure. So, uh, you know, he comes from, you know, a place in the country that seems to specialize in some of this stuff. Um, his home life, though, was a turbulent one. He was one of three kids. He was the first one. Uh, and his dad was a traveling salesman. The mom stayed home with the kids, which, of course, would have been common back in that time period. Um, they bounced around, though, about, probably because the father was supposed to be a raging fucking alcoholic. Right. So, And on his uh, some of his uh, traveling salesman trips, he was just out with other women and shit, dude. Right, so right. just like, Yeah, whatever. he was not a good dude at all. Uh, frequent rages, uh, just, just very turbulent situation. Um, so... Gerard Schaefer's born mostly, though, in the Nashville, Tennessee area, and then they moved to Atlanta, where he uh, went to a Catholic school, um, and then they moved to Fort Lauderdale, Florida in 1960. So, like I said, he moved around quite a bit. Uh, his parents, though, wind up getting divorced while he's still in school, and he's also known to torture animals, which we've talked about that before with some of these serial killers that That's we've, where it starts. we've done. A lot of them, you know, start that way. Now, Chris... He just wanted to... He, he said he just wanted to shoot the ones he couldn't eat. Like, yeah, right? right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he was a real sportsman, that's for sure. Uh, now, Chris, we've covered killers that come from households like this. You know, the abusive dad. dad always brutal and shit. And he's da he, his dad liked his sisters better so right. he felt bad like he not bad but he felt like he wanted to be a girl that way because he felt like he might get more attention from his dad or right and whatnot if he was a girl but his dad because his dad didn't pay any attention to him yeah so then he starts like messing with girls clothes and shit like trying to do whatever it is but yeah. Then he gets violent and uh like age 12 decides yeah he likes to choke himself and shit like, yeah he starts getting kind of wacky <laughs> yeah. as he gets into his teen years but like you said chris he's doing this because he thinks it's going to get him more attention because his dad favored the girls yeah so he starts getting into some cross-dressing here now joey it's interesting though as like a total opposite of the cross-dressing thing he loves the outdoors hunting fishing you know real guy stuff uh what do you think is the deal with that uh, it, it it's probably, in my opinion, uh, largely due to the fact that he had all those other desires, you know, saying that he should have been born a girl and this and that. And of course, we're talking about back then. We're not talking about right now. Right. When this you know, is people, very accepted today. You're right. Back then, that you would have been looked at oh, as, yeah. as really freak. fucked up. A so freak, yeah maybe uh some of his interests and things of that in his normal everyday life was geared more towards um you know being masculine i guess i'd say so that he would push himself away from that other part of his life in the view of everybody you know yeah right. almost like a gacy i wonder if he felt bad so he tried yeah, to overcompensate yeah. for it or like a beard so that people wouldn't know that that was his inclination, you know, yeah. hard to say. I mean, you know, and I, he seemed to generally like love nature and all that for real. And part of that also might be because that was like a sanctuary away from his home life, uh, right. away from the things in the world that he didn't like and things like that, too. Yeah, you no. get out in the woods and you're by yourself peaceful and nobody yeah. bothering yeah. you yeah because yeah, he wanted to be a forest ranger that was like his lifelong yeah. thing you yeah. know so it's hard to say so now as chris points out he's entering adolescence and we all know what that's about your body's just in a fucking mess your head's in a thousand places he begins to go off the fucking rails with some real dark fantasy stuff yeah. that involved hurting women and here we go again, and if there's not a fucking band by this name, I'm going to have to start a fucking <laughs> side project here. <laughs> Madonna Whore Complex. Madonna Whore Complex. If there is not a metal band by that name, 
Uh, you need to be slapped. Somebody needs to take that fucking name. That's a good name, okay? Uh, we've talked about this, though, guys, so many times where women were either one or the other, right? There's no middle ground. You're either angelic or you're, or a, you're a total whore. whore. Yeah. One, there's no in between. They can just be mind. a female. Yeah, so <laughs> he's just that way. And so um, he genuinely felt contempt for most women. So this is not a good thing. He also liked to inflict pain on himself, and he's got these bondage fantasies uh, like we talked about, the wearing women's panties, very similar to BTK. Uh, he, he called them underpanties. Is that what he called them? <laughs> <laughs> he's a goofy son of a bitch, man. Like Joey said, he's got that stupid fucking smile on his face. Um, but very similar to BTK. Um, he's also into the whole autoerotic as asphyxia where you choke yourself to almost passing out and it's supposed to increase your feelings at orgasm definitely not my thing but <laughs> hey what the fuck ever you know whatever yeah, he said tie himself like straight up tie himself to trees and like inflict pain on himself thinking of other of ways to hurt females and yeah shit, like. definitely fucked up i mean certainly not the norm at, at 12 like i said at 12 years old right exactly <laughs> exactly so Pretty, uh, pretty strange. Now, Chris, I was wondering if we can get your brother Michael, because Michael's a good sport, yeah. to actually try the auto asphyxia I, thing. I, I don't know about that. I don't think he'd be. I mean, unless he's like jerking off and smoking some weed and chokes on the weed. Maybe. Oh, there you go. <laughs> you call that weed whacking? <laughs> <laughs> but so we'll have to find out though and have Michael report back for us. But Schaefer was also doing some peep and tom shit going on chris so yeah. uh that's when, one of those things we've talked about before kind of starts with that yeah, yeah. So I was gonna say it's where like if you got those kind of feelings when you're that young already you're kind of not thinking about what you're doing when you go fucking around looking at women's through women's windows or whatever right so you're a young kid you got some fucked up thoughts in your head let's go check this out Right. So that's what he does, and it, it gets to going really good. And fucking wants to kill him. Yeah, definitely. Uh, he starts with the Peep and Tom thing and escalates. And, Joey, I know we've talked about the cross-dressing element with serial killers before. Uh, Ed Gein would be the, the most extreme, but, you know, BTK, like I mentioned, um, and even some fictional characters joey yeah i mean it, and like i said coming from back then it used to be looked at as a very taboo thing and right. something that like weirdos or strange people were involved in and they also associated that with killers and stuff it seems you know true uh, like you said in in, in movies and in novels and a lot of that i mean yeah silence yeah, of the lambs the people... with buffalo bill that'd be a good one it, yeah, um, and exa I mean, it was the same influence, but I was just going to say, you know, uh, Norman Bates, Psycho, right. coming there you out go. dressed as his mom. I mean, yes, so, very yeah. much, very much. The, the, the true crime working hand in hand with fiction all the time, for sure. Um, so he does date some women in high school, um, and one of which we're going to talk about a little bit later on. She's a true crime author, uh, Sandra London, but we'll get to that in a minute. Um, but, uh, she dated him and said he was pretty normal um, and didn't have anything bad to say that I heard. But another woman would later say that Schaefer liked to do some role pet play, kind of kinky stuff, like he was raping her. Um, eventually, she gets tired of this shit. Um, a lot of his classmates didn't really care for him. I could see why. Yeah, he seems no like shit. a real fucking asshole. Um, but he's the classic loner. Another one of those traits, guys, that we see a lot with these serial killers. Can't get along with people. Doesn't get along with others. Probably picked on some. Um, doesn't fit in anywhere. Um, and sometimes they get lost in their own, like, fantasy world. And in Schaefer's case, uh, he's definitely going into some dark fantasies that were becoming, like, obsessive. And he's thinking about them, like, every fucking waking minute. So pretty fucked up 
And that's not good when that's all you're thinking about all the no. fucking time either. No, I mean, an adolescent boy is thinking about pussy like, like 90% of the time. And like maybe Cash eating. Was Lividity shirt. That's right. <laughs> but this guy is like 100% like and dark, twisted yeah, just shit. Yeah, not just thinking about, hey, I need to get laid. Talking about, right. I want to hurt Tying somebody. Tying people up, hurting people, doing fucked up shit. Um, now, I did real that, read that one female he went to high school with said he was always by himself, didn't seem to have any friends, but she did mention that he had a thing for looking up girls' skirts. Hell yeah. Get and it, he made sure her, <laughs> she made sure hers was tucked in so he couldn't look up her skirt. So she's kind of a party pooper. I, I, I'm confused. I bet, I bet he made sure his was tucked in, too. I, right? I'm, I'm just kind of curious. <laughs> so like Buffalo <laughs> Bill. Looking up the skirt, like what she got it tucked up into. I know. I was wondering the same thing. But she said he would have stood on his head to get a look up a girl's skirt, <laughs> which sounds like Crazy Mike to me yeah, because he yeah, used yeah. to do that shit all the time. <laughs> I used to be at shows looking at that camera afterwards like, God damn, what the fuck, dude? You're going to get your ass whipped. Hell yeah. Doing that to the wrong fucking female. So not cool, but uh, reminds me of Crazy Mike. Um, now, Chris, sounds like things are escalating with this dude. And oddly, he excels in some things, but he's like a fucking ticking time bomb in other ways. I think uh, the more he gets going into this, like these fucked up shit that he's doing. Right. The more it drives him into wanting to go deeper and deeper into harder, darker things and like just go full force into where he eventually gets to yeah and he it's almost it's, like a drug like he yeah, keeps yeah, needing exactly. more yeah, you know exactly. it's not like enough to like, to tie himself up so now he's got to tie up somebody else and, and now he, it's turning into and, torture and then of course into murder so and eventually it's not him, up. Yeah, and not him tying himself up it's like oh i'm tying someone else up yeah. and he doesn't have other people tying him up so it fucking just went totally different direction it did it really did because he's like really excelling in varsity football he's getting good grades in school um he was a good golfer apparently graduated from saint thomas aquinas uh high school in uh, 1964 so he graduates high school 1964 now stuff starts to go downhill uh, because he becomes a fishing guide for a period of time in the Everglades, which sounds like a dream job for a guy that loves the outdoors. Also makes you wonder if that's where he got the idea of how to dispose of some victims, Chris. Right. You know, Pee Wee Gaskins, right? Dude. He was one that was all about the Gators, man. Joe Ball, you know, some of these guys that got ideas for, hey, pig farm with Picton, right? A, a way to get rid of a body in a very right, right. you know simple fashion feed it to the to the uh gators so joey what do you think about that with him and his interest in the everglades and you know how that all might have worked in with his with his murders you know it's it's hard for me to uh to really answer that because i don't really know enough about like really where and how he killed and disposed of the supposed number of bodies that he has, you know? Right. Uh, the few, the few cases that he was tried on, of course, those details are a little more, um, prominent, but supposedly, and if you, you know, even if half of what they say is true, it's pretty high body count. Right. But, uh, I don't know. It's hard to say without knowing that stuff, really, you know. It is, and I think what gave me the idea of that, Joey, was that I think in one of the Sandra London interviews, she talks about that that was a way he mentioned was a, a good way to get rid of a body. So, yeah, yeah. again, like you've pointed correctly, you know, we don't know, but we could speculate right. and make some, you know, just bringing it up, you know, letting the listeners decide yeah, yep. what they think. Uh, but I think it's definitely a possibility, especially with that many victims. You know, they weren't finding that I'm aware of that many bodies. So he was right, obviously right. getting rid of them in some way. Um, so after graduation, he ends up enrolling in college because he's getting good grades. He goes to Broward Community College, which was in Fort Lauderdale. Um, he 
started out as a social studies major, but then changed to teaching. He got good grades in college. He was offered a scholarship for Florida Atlantic University in Boca Raton in 1968. Um, so again, he's doing really well in some things, but in some parts of his life, he's, he's not. Um, he was going for a bachelor's apparently in education. Now, depending on what you believe, uh, Schaefer may have already started his killing by then in 1964 when he was a senior or just after he graduated um, because, again, some of the stuff that he wrote about in those fictional, quote-unquote, uh, pieces he did go back to that time period right after high school. Um, he also considered, I saw this being a priest. <laughs> Which is funny. Yeah, right? Uh, but was told by another priest that he didn't have the faith for it, so he <laughs> should give up on the idea. So apparently that was not you know, meant for him. He gave up on the whole Catholic Church entirely. And then it said he went and spent time touring the United States with a group of Christians to spread the word of God through music and uh, but some people about that said, Joey, it was more like a like a cult. A cult. Yeah, there was something about it. This is sounding yeah, like hippie fuck bus here. What do you think? Uh, right, right. Yeah, I agree with that. <laughs> and I definitely think it probably was something that bordered more on the cult. Yeah, you know? it kind of screams that, especially from that era, the late 60s, you know, definitely could have been something like that. But it was in this group, though, uh, where he met Marty, um, who uh, would later, of course, become his wife in 1968, um, only a couple of years um, to Marty. But, you know, things go south because, you know, he, he gets married, but then a couple of years of that, things start to go south. He's demanding sex from her all the time. Did you see that, Joey? He's like... Yeah, constantly wanting the pussy, which we've heard about that with a lot of different, you know, characters, too. Right, right. Yeah, there's been some good ones like that. Um, what was the one? I think it was um, the uh, Belangelo. Um, oh, uh, Ivan Malat. I think Malat <laughs> yeah. was like that, wasn't he? Yeah, he was definitely <laughs> like that. Uh, so he's he's wanting sex all the time, and he's spending all his free time hunting. So she's getting aggravated. They wind up getting divorced. Pussy. Yeah, I mean, what's the problem, right? Uh, they wind up getting divorced in 1970. She cited extreme cruelty as the reason, um, and he would get involved with a physically disabled woman which is another crazy Mike thing, but I digress. But that doesn't last long. So funny how crazy Mike's name keeps coming up in these, in these episodes we do. Uh, but Chris, Schaefer seemed to have is issues with relationships. I mean, what was the deal with that? I mean, you're narcissistic as he is and very controlling and violent. Nobody wants to be in a relationship with somebody like that. And True. if they are, they're, they're, basically brainwashed into having to be in that relationship i feel like right so yeah like i said nobody wants to be in a relationship with somebody so controlling and always i'm the better person and then if if you don't agree with me i'm just gonna beat the shit out of you and whatever <laughs> yeah not an easy person to deal with at all and then joey in 69 schaefer lands a job at a high school what's the deal with this in plantation florida have they made his cancel culture made them change their name i wonder <laughs> right how is Man, that still a thing to. how is that still a thing right but but uh yeah him working yeah, at a high up. school not a good idea no that's terrible and i mean pedophiles like... playground man he already tried to be a priest and they wouldn't let him in there right. so he's got a pedophile some other way there you go but he uh, he i mean he was teaching geography and he ends up getting fired uh because he's pretty much insubordinate to his fucking you know the principal and the right. the higher ups there at the school yeah um 
And that also they were talking about he was trying to force his beliefs on the kids in his classrooms and stuff. Right. So he's in there supposed to be teaching, you know, this syllabus, and he's right. got his own fucking thing. He's teaching them. I mean, he ends up becoming a writer and shit, so yeah, I'm sure he had fucking all kinds of ideas fucking mapped out and was, you know, trying to fucking imp- plant them on these kids yeah but not a good environment for a guy of his inclination that's for sure uh um he's also trying to push his conservative agenda on the kids which kind of you know gets the people at the school upset you know he's pushing that agenda which would have been you know obviously against the hippie movement of that time which probably would have got a lot of people pretty stirred up so Right, right. Yeah, this guy definitely would have been canceled in the modern world for sure. But I got to know. Plantation, I got to know. I got to know if plantation's still a thing because that's fucked up. Now, I'm, I'm going to look it up. Right yeah, now. go ahead. Now, a few months later in 1970, he tries to teach at another high school but fails. Uh, he just doesn't have a good fit anywhere. This guy just cannot seem to get along with others he should have been one of those guys wearing that shirt that says doesn't play well with others you know this guy's just fucked up um now he decides to go into policing so uh, he's all over the board he starts out doing some security for actually whacking hut so he's working for whacking hut it's vodka he's, hut <laughs> he's he's whacking it in his free time he's whacking it at work and he's whacking hut uh then he gets a job at the Wilton Manors, Florida Police Department. So Wilton Manors, Florida, hires this dude to be a cop. Uh, that's in Broward County. Uh, he winds up getting found lying on his application and not telling him that he was fired twice as a teacher. So, so he ends up with the Broward County Police Department after graduating the academy in 1971. So they take him. Uh, he winds up being a patrolman for, you know, he's 25 years old. Uh, he gets married in 1971 to Teresa, so he's remarried. And uh, he actually met her, I guess, while he was a security guard. And then uh, while they were going out, he becomes a cop for the Broward County Police Department. Apparently, she was cool with yeah. his sex drive. And uh, she also she liked to fish. So, Chris. I yeah, mean, she's cool with everything. Everything smells like fish. So, fuck it. Let's do Yeah, this. I mean, this is like his dream woman. <laughs> right, I mean, definitely. Fishing man. and fucking, you know? I mean, it's like. I mean, wow. I feel like if he had met the right person, he who'd we just do the couple that. We, if he had met the right person, he could have done a couple's thing where she went and helped him. Do oh, those, definitely. You know what I'm saying? Like, oh, yeah, for good sure, thing dude. He didn't meet the, his dream woman. Yeah, she sounds like it, though. Right. I mean, on the she, surface here. She's like nature loving and loves, wants to fuck all the time. Yeah, so, like, so hey, what the hell? And didn't care about his fucking hang ups or whatever. Right, so. right. Uh, now, Joey, I saw when he was with the Wilt Manors Police Department, he was reprimanded for pulling over a lot of females. Jesus Did you Christ. see that? Yeah, uh, and let me just clarify real fast. The plantation is definitely still it's still a, a city thing in Florida. Wow! And there's ninety two thousand people there at the last census. Wow! So Damn. it's, it's <laughs> wow. pretty fucking big. That's like Bloomington <laughs> normal. Right. Damn. Yeah, that's crazy. Okay, so uh, <laughs> so yeah, so while while he's with the Wilton Manors Police Department, like you said, he got in trouble. He was taking excessive, you know. Um, fucking stops on females and stuff like that but the thing was is he was taking their information as he was pulling them over and getting their licenses and stuff and he was keeping that retaining it for himself right and then he would come out and then ask these women on dates right. call them up and so like fucking, that's fucking that's just creepy, creepy as, as fuck. right yeah it's ballsy yeah. too yeah he gets their license plate yeah. info so he knows their address and shit phone numbers he's like hey girl you know i'm a cop you know i'm a good guy (laughs) right sorry i pulled you over yeah what the hell so uh so that's not good so he's he's just not doing well at anything he does so now he ends up with the martin county sheriff's department in 1972 and he does this by forging letters of recommendation and since he passes the background check he gets the job uh, he really does bounce around a lot. I mean, uh, for jobs as well as in as in his women. 
Um, and this dude just does not fucking seem to fit in anywhere. Um, but this is a time, uh, you know, in, in his time at Martin County Sheriff's Department that he really starts to ramp up the deviant behavior. And uh, oh. we're going to get to some of this real brutal shit yeah, here the now. Shit he does. Yeah. I mean, you have to wonder if he was doing that shit the whole time since he graduated high school. Um, I tend to believe this guy was killing women in some way from 1964 until he gets busted. That's in oh, my I'm opinion. Sure, dude. Like, I goes, think he was slowly hard, yeah. practicing his little routine and how he was going to abduct him and all this shit, fantasizing about it. But this shit gets really dark. Uh, 1972, July 1972, he's only been on his job at the police station at Martin County in Florida for a month. He's on patrol. <laughs> he picks up two 17-year-old girls, Pamela Trotter and Nancy Wells, who were hitchhiking. So he tells them, you know, about the dangers of hitchhiking and all he that. He tells them that, like, it's illegal, like, fault, like, not right. allowed to do it. And he, like, tells them, like, I'll fucking drive you to the beach. Let's right. go. Come on, I'll help you out. Yeah, <laughs> and he, he gets their guard down. Of course, he's a cop, so you naturally yeah, trust the him. Yeah, going to be like, okay, cool. We got yeah. a safe ride, whatever. This is safe. He's trying to do the right thing. You know, he's preaching to us about uh, not hitchhiking, which, you know, obviously there's some validity to that because we talk about that all the time, yeah, how these women get shit. abducted that yeah. way. So, so that's a good cover here as it starts up. Um, and then he picks them up again the next day. They make this arrangement where he's supposed to take them to the beach again. But he has some other plans, oh, Chris. Yeah, once he picks them up and gets them in the car, he just takes them out to like the woods or a swamp or whatever. Yeah, Hutchison Island was yeah, this remote gets out area. There and starts talking to them all fucking like sexual and shit, and they weren't having it. But he didn't give a fuck. Right. He fucking ties them up, like puts them. Got, has them standing with like these tree roots or whatever with nooses around their neck to where right if they fell they're gonna fucking hang themselves fucking starts just like touching them and torturing them basically while they're hanging there and then he just fucking leaves them there and he he leaves but luckily one of the girls was able to fucking get out of the noose and they were both able to escape and shit but yeah dude just like like they, like if they slip they're done, done They're for. Done, he just yeah. left them there, dude. Like a <coughs> yeah. They sedative. show this tree in the documentary, and these roots are like coming up out of the ground. But it was precarious. I mean, they had just a little bit of rope and one slip on this, yeah, on this tree root, and they would have been hung, you know, hung themselves. So uh, and, pretty. And he was up. drawing pictures of that shit later on too. Right? right? Yes, he was. He was. <laughs> They were using that art for whenever they fucking put out his book or whatever, Killer Fiction. Mm hmm Yeah. I uh, I definitely think these girls are very lucky to They're get very, away. Very lucky, yeah. Um, and Joey, yeah. he goes back to get the girls because he got a call on the radio. He had to go deal with something. He comes back, and, and he, what does he find when he gets back? <laughs> They're fucking gone. Right. Because, you know, the girl got out and fucking helped the other one escape. And they're fucking, they took off. They're out in the woods. So he's like, oh, fuck. So he knows that they're going to go and fucking tell somebody right away. Right. So he goes back. He fucking contacts his sergeant. Right. And he's like, he's like, look, I did something stupid. Yeah, I messed think up. It's dumb. <laughs> yeah. And he no and shit. basically what he... He told them that fucking he he kidnapped these girls and he was trying to teach them a lesson. He was just trying to scare them to not to teach them, yeah. you know, what could happen. Yeah, yeah. Right. And fucking yeah, they didn't buy that shit. He was <laughs> fired on the spot. Yeah, they they show the sheriff on the one documentary I watch and he's just like, "What an idiot," you know. <laughs> fucking dumb as <laughs> shit. But they but they found the girls. The girls were hiding in the woods and when the uh the rest of the police force showed up, they came out to him and shit. Yeah. I mean, how are you going to want to come out to the freaking cops when the cops the one that fucking just did that shit to you? Right? Like, that, yeah. that'd be kind of scary anyway. Yeah. Definitely. I mean, I thought it was fucked up. They had the girls recreate the events that went on in the woods with the noose and everything at the tree. And I can't imagine 
how scary that must have been for them and then how fucking bizarre that would be to have to go right back out there and show them how he did this but you know this just does not bode well for him he's obviously disgraced he's being arrested by the police force that he's working for so that makes him look of course horrible and yet another fuck up another lost job because this guy's just being a complete and total right. shithead and now it's escalated to you know sexually assaulting these girls and terrorizing the shit out of them uh, so like you guys said he gets fired he's charged with false imprisonment and aggravated assault and Schaefer posts his bond and gets out of jail and this he does is when some just the shit just continues. I mean, most people would be scared to fucking death. <laughs> Leave their fucking house. Would fucking stay the fuck home or do as little as you had to do to be as good as you could be to avoid getting into any more trouble. And this motherfucker is like, nope, I'm going to go out and abduct more fucking chicks. So I mean, that should be he's the like, He's thing. like, my plan, his plan was, was to get him two girls and he was tired of that shit. He, they fucking caught him on the first one, but he wasn't ready to stop, though. No, he wasn't. So he's out on bond. He decides to go back to abducting young girls. Um, two months later, he picks up 16-year-old Georgia Jessup and 17-year-old Susan Place. He takes them to the beach, and Susan's mom was very uneasy, you know, this older guy, but, you know, he talks a good game. Um, she, you know, lets him go, but her intuition was right because she winds up writing down his license plate number, gets a good description of him and the make of the car, which was a Datsun. So that was smart of her to do that. Unfortunately, though, she writes down the wrong license plate yeah, number, but wrong. we'll get to that. Um, <laughs> so Chris, the girls never come back. So... What happens with this whole situation? I mean, like you said, she wrote down the license plate number because, like, he picked them up, and like she saw them leaving with, with him. Right. And obviously, you see your freaking kid getting in a vehicle with an older person. It's like, I'd right. be fucking. Yeah, first of all, up. first of all, like, I don't even know this person. Fuck no, dude. Right. I wouldn't even let it happen, dude. Right. But. She let it happen, but like you said, she wrote down the license plate number wrong in the car. But I, I don't know, man. I feel I weird out when my fucking kids hang out with kids. Kids that, you don't that know I don't well. know. I know. Like yeah, let you alone some who? grown up dude. Definitely creepy as fuck. Um, so unfortunately, Joey, six months goes by, um, but the pol the police finally figure it out. Because they found this letter in Susan's room. What was the deal with that? They found a letter in a room, but it was under the name Jeffrey Shepard. Right. Uh, but the address is on the letter, so whenever they linked right. that back, they found out that the owner of the property, to which the house, you know, uh, the return address or whatnot, right. was Gerard, Gerard Schaefer. Right. So um, Couldn't even they change go his name. <laughs> pretty stupid. No, no. But uh, they go and uh, they search his mother's home. Um, I believe that's where he was staying at the time. Right. And they definitely ended up finding some fucking souvenirs and such. Oh, there. They really did. And so he really fucks up by, you know, that letter being found. Um, but they also find a whole bunch of stuff. Human teeth, mementos. Pieces of IDs. Articles of missing about missing women which I know Joe Naso was all about that. Right. Um, and then a journal that he kept about his sadomasochism. Uh, there was a passport there. I mean, all kinds of of evidence. I mean, really, really fucking stupid. Um, and, there and this is uh, this is probably one of the biggest reasons why I think that, you know, maybe not 100 bodies or whatnot, but I'm sure he probably had double digits, you know, in the 20s uh, or something because the amount of stuff that they found and could link to people, right? they just couldn't uh, prove it or whatnot, was, it, that shit was there. That was factual right, shit. Right, right. Yeah, definitely I agree with you. I think easily into the double digits with this guy. 
Um, but there were also pictures of Schaefer in women's clothing. Of course, we saw that with BTK and articles of women's clothes, clothing like panties, bras, and socks that he kept as souvenirs. Under panties. Under panties, that's right. <laughs> um, no pantyhose, though, apparently. <laughs> nope. Uh, with, with all the stuff they found, it appeared he had a lot more than two victims. Um, they also found Susan's purse at his house, which that was their connection then they could make to him with her. So they, they had that, which was good. Uh, the bodies of Susan and Georgia were found by hikers on Hutchison Island, and their remains were identified, and autopsies would show they were beaten, assaulted, and one of the girls had been shot in the jaw. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. he even carved his initials into the bark of the tree. Not very smart. I mean, for as smart yeah. as this guy was, Chris, he did some he was dumb. dumbass shit. <laughs> I mean, he puts his High initials. High on the brilliance, low on the common sense. Yeah, really <laughs> stupid. Uh, once he hears, though, about the bodies being discovered, he starts shredding a short story he had written in jail about their encounter. But was he shredding like sick ripper? <laughs> probably not. Probably not. Uh, so so this would be a thing with him, you know. He would get into this writing of the stories which we're going to talk about. Now Chris, here we fucking go again. We need a library card with this dude because he's like Jack Unterweger. Yeah, and Robert like but like yeah, and he just took his stories and like what he actually did in real life and kind of fudged them a little bit, a little bit to make it sound. And he's like, Oh no, these are just fictional stories. Right. I didn't really do this. And the cops are like, no motherfucker. This is pretty much too much detail as to what the fuck actually went on. Right. Like you, we know better than that. And you wrote exactly. this shit down. We know, dude. Exactly. It, it's not fiction. You did this shit. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, you know, we went to that last week with Robert Stroud with the books he wrote on birds. And now we're talking with Schaefer. I mean, this has just been a funny undercurrent in a lot of these episodes we've, right. we've done writing recently. Books. Yeah. The, the, the serial killers writing books, but the, the cops know this guy's full of shit and that these are real. I mean, Joey, at least, they you, didn't, at least they didn't let uh, Schaefer out like they did Undertaker. <laughs> that's true. That's true. <laughs> now, at least they weren't trying. At least they weren't like petitioning to get him released. Right. right? right. Yeah. <laughs> Fifty thousand fucking signatures for Stroud. Wow. Now, Joey, did you see that jailhouse interview with him laughing and talking about himself as an author and shit? Yeah, I mean, that's the. He was like, this was all just, you know, shit that they took from my writings, and, you know, I'm a writer. Right. <laughs> and it, it's, it's funny because uh, this guy ends up trying to fucking sue everybody, and we'll talk about oh, that yeah. too. Like, yeah. everybody. But <laughs> it's funny because if, if you look at the premise for, like, the movie fucking Basic Instinct with Sharon Stone, like, right. that's the whole thing is she fucking kills somebody the exact same way that she wrote a book about. So her alibi is, why the fuck would I do something whenever I've already written it? It would be almost, you know impossible for somebody to fucking believe that you could do that right so that's almost like his alibi too but before that so it's funny he's not like hey that's my fucking you know idea and basic instinct right. get I, I know, yeah, right? Right? Yeah. <laughs> that's funny yeah i mean this dude is a fucking piece of work man but those jailhouse interviews just make you want to just bound his oh, head yeah. into a fucking wall uh, the trial begins in September of 1973. Uh, the two girls who got away would testify against Schaefer and tell their stories about what happened. And, of course, this matches up with how things went down with Georgia and Susan. Uh, Susan's mother would also testify. And the jury finds him guilty after just a 10-day trial, and he winds up getting two life sentences. So pretty, pretty slam dunk. Uh, the police start going through all the newspaper clippings that Schaefer had been keeping. Uh, one of them was a missing waitress, Carmen uh, Hellick, and she ends up missing in 1969. And a pin that she owned was in his bedroom as one of those mementos 
and one of the teeth. teeth they found was linked to her as well. So what the hell? Um, and then another girl, Leah Von Denise, uh, was missing and her jewelry was found in his home. Uh, two young girls that were 14 and 15 were missing and articles were found in Schaefer's bedroom along with some jewelry there. So all those mementos, I mean, they weren't able to solve all of them, but there were a number of cases that they had pretty good, you know, solid links to him and them. Why else would you have their fucking teeth in your yeah, fucking why, yeah, dresser you, drawer? Especially you know? teeth. I mean, yeah, possessions that's fucked are one up. thing, but... Yeah, that's teeth. fucked up. So, Chris, with all the shit he has in his bedroom, I mean, there's no telling how many victims this dude could have had. And he could have had so many, like... Like I said, the police, like, think it might be close to 30, but then he, like, started going with his narcissism. He's like, I don't know, it could have been 30, it could have been... 80 right 110 i don't know and he just kept on going with it but when you got so many items and like you said like teeth and whatever fucking of missing women in your room (laughs) in your your bedroom in your bedroom like how can you not be linked to this shit missing it's not like (laughs) exactly happen to find all this random stuff sitting in the street like everybody everybody that's missing like no you're right makes sense so like he's got a pretty high got count higher than what they what they got busted for i'm i know for sure yeah i agree with you man 100 percent. now joey a woman named belinda hutchins who dated him in 72 she ends up missing uh and they found an address book of hers at schaefer's but you know this is just you know again you just keep finding more and more this is kind of like you know peeling an onion right with this dude yeah they uh you can look it up on a i can't i don't think it was murderpedia but something like that but you can look it up and you can see all the the victims that they linked to him not necessarily that he was convicted of course they got those but right there's a lot of them and the probability that he was involved is very, very high in almost every one of those because a huge link is to something, you know, material that was theirs that he ended up with, um, if not part of their body, like a tooth, like you said. Right. So, I don't know, man. It's uh, he had all that shit. The 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 Belinda Hutchins, like that was that's almost a guarantee that he did something to her, but. He was never, he was only convicted of a few of the, the people. That right, were. only two. So, yeah. Uh, so Schaefer goes on, um, you know, and they're, you know, they're going back. There could be, you know, 20, 30, maybe 40 of these. It's crazy. Um, but he goes on, he keeps writing his dark short stories, claiming they're fiction. Uh, he also gets busted for trying to get women to send him their undergarments to the prison, <laughs> which God is hilarious. Um, I will. I, I'm only going to say that fucking I, I don't even fault him for that because people in the joint, that's like a fucking huge request. Oh, from I bet. Almost all of yeah, them. Oh, I'm sure. Send me a pair yeah. of but do they get past, though? I mean, I, I don't know. I don't know. I guess it depends really saw no, how well they can. Yeah, I never it. saw any panties in prison, so <laughs> if anybody got them, they must have hit them pretty Keeping well. Keeping them to right? themselves, right? Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, so, um, you know, he winds up getting put in solitary over it. Um, he's filing an appeal after appeal, claiming shit like drug dealers framed him. Uh, <laughs> he's filing lawsuits, like you guys mentioned, um, against true crime authors who are writing about him. And one of those I mentioned earlier was Sandra London. Who, who dated. <laughs> dated the dude. What are the odds of that? She's a true crime author. She dated him in high school. And she writes a book about the whole thing, uh, which she actually, I conversed with her on Messenger uh, when I first discovered her tie with this, because uh, we have some mutual friends and um on facebook and so she was nice enough to respond but she sent me an e-copy of i don't know if it's both of these or just one but i think i have a an electronic copy of killer fiction 
Uh, I just yeah, did. You can t- pull up the PDF if you look it up. Oh, for sure, for sure. Yeah. Um, but she publishes the story collection from him called Killer Fiction in 1990 and then Beyond Killer Fiction in 1992. And he would go on to try and sue her. And he also threatened her life, which is, uh, you know, like, fucked her. What are you going to do? You ain't got nobody. You're in prison by yourself. Fucking. It, it, my, my favorite one was he tried to sue Robert Ressler of the FBI. Yeah, what was the deal? I saw Ressler was mentioned. What how did did you see why? Because it's something about because he was I think he was uh teaching lectures at lecture halls and he was using um Gerard as one of the people that he would say oh, in the serial killer oh, category right. or something ah. like that. And he was like that that's falsifying information and he called it liable and then but they ended up saying that almost every one of the uh, the suits that he filed, it was already too too far past the actual event uh, for him to get liable. And I saw that there was one judge where he fucking ruled that the acts that Gerard Schaefer uh, got convicted of were so vile that he was he he could never sue for libel ever. Ah, okay. Because he was such a heinous dude, yeah. Interesting. Oh, fucked up. Yeah, that is fucked up. So, uh, you know, who knows with this dude. Um, But, Chris, I mean, did you see that Schaefer was uh, friends in prison with Ted Bundy? Did you see that? That's pretty messed up. You got those two in there together, man. Right? Talking shop, you know. Yeah, like, (laughs) he fucking, like, talking about how much, I don't know how much friends they were. They got fucking talking about who had the most fucking kills or whatever, like right. chessboard and fucking Chickatillo. Right, like, like a little contest right, about like, it. Man, I got more than you. That's why I think maybe he pumped them numbers up a little bit. <laughs> that's very possible like because want, we know to, that that's a big thing with these guys. Right, trying to impress Bundy himself. He's just like, God right. damn, well, I got a fucking, what can I do? What can I do? Oh, well, he yeah. said also he was when, at, when he first met Bundy, uh, Bundy recognized him and said, hey, I know who you yeah. are. So he was like all yeah. poof chested yeah. about that. Oh, yeah, yeah, you know me because you're like one of the most famous. But, yeah, but he was in there with a uh, Otis Tool also. That's right. So you know <laughs> that's another person that you got to compete with, right. and you know there was all that uh, the media coverage because of the Adam Walsh case. True. With Otis Tool for a while there, and Gerard like basically tried to get in on that almost, and you know he was shot down. But that goes to show you that these motherfuckers will try to uh, put themselves into certain crimes or jump their numbers up just for clout in the serial killer world. Oh, yeah, for sure. And Joey, I mean, he said that Bundy uh, told him that he was one of his inspirations for killing young women. I'm not not sure about that, but that's what he's <laughs> claiming. Um, he also you said know, they shared tips on how to clean up bodily fluids. Did you see that? I saw that, and I don't... I don't know how much fucking Ted Bundy was caring about cleaning his cars back then. It almost I seemed know. like he didn't fucking ever feel like he would get caught. But right. <clears throat> it's it's funny, you know, for him to say that he was an inspiration to him. And I mean, I, I don't know how one would take that in that situation. Right. <laughs> but if you're an infamous killer, maybe you're like, okay, right on. Yeah, you know? exactly. Exactly. Kind of fucked up. But he claims, you know, that he started killing at 19... Uh, which would have been 1965, and his body count could have been upwards of 100, but who knows. Um, right. December of 95, at the age of 49, Gerard Schaefer was attacked by another inmate and was stabbed 43 times and died in his cell, stabbed all over his body, his throat slashed, one of his eyes practically gouged out. I saw both of his eyes were fucking... Was it both of them? That's what I saw. I I don't know. It's very possible. I wasn't there. Uh, (laughs) That's good. Uh, His alleged uh, killer was Vincent Rivera, but he never admitted it. They argued the day before over some hot water, apparently. Uh, Some say (laughs) shit. Took that last hot cup of coffee. Yeah, that's right. Pissed the motherfucker off. Pissed him the fuck off. (laughs) Man. Yeah. Uh, Some say Schaefer had a lot of enemies and inmates thought he was a snitch, which... We know how that goes, um, but whatever the case may be, I'm glad this piece of shit is dead. He's a fucking awful fucking human being. 
Uh, when he died, the police were working on bringing charges for some of the other cases that we've talked about here. So he very well could have been charged if he would have been alive right. on other crimes uh, as uh, as this all went down. So crazy story for sure. Killer cop. Uh, guys, anything to add to this one? Uh, I don't think so. I'm fucking cool. Joey? I got a couple things I was going to say. Yeah. Um, one of them was about, uh, S- Sandra London. Yeah. And her and, uh, and Gerard, they were engaged for a period of time. Okay. And she left him, I think in, uh, 1991, I think they got engaged in 91 and then she ended up leaving him. And the story goes that she left him for Danny Rawlings. Really? Oh shit! Yeah. <laughs> oh my god! So, I, wow. I don't. I don't know if that's true, but that's a pretty good killer cage match, right? Yeah, right. right. Yeah. right? <laughs> Little love triangle there. Uh, and then uh, the other thing I was going to add was uh, I had a quote from Gerard Schaefer that is just fucking ridiculous. <laughs> but uh, but Schaefer said uh, <clears throat> he said. Uh, Doing doubles is far more difficult than doing singles, but on the other hand, it also puts one in a position to have twice as much fun. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I also saw when he was like uh, talking about his count and Mick, like changing the numbers. He's like said something like, uh, "What about the pregnant ones? Does that count as two? Oh, right. Yeah. yeah. And, I did see that. And there was the one where uh, he said uh, the one girl. Uh, choked to death on her own vomit as he was like uh disemboweling her girlfriend or whatever he didn't know if that counted as a kill or not because like did you see that yeah that's that's wow. fucking crazy dude that like it's crazy so there's a lot going on with him that like, yeah pretty like, disturbing if you could fucking just call me be like what about the pregnant ones does that count as two right and just call like <laughs> just no nonchalant about it like holy fuck dude it's definitely fucked up all right. Well, very good. I did my research for this one by watching a couple of good documentaries on YouTube, a few articles on Murderpedia. I love that uh, website. Also reached out to author Sa- Sandra London, as I mentioned, um, about having her come on. But she wanted it to coincide with the book she has coming out, and it didn't work out. So it would have been cool, but it wasn't able to happen. Um, we do have well. If you talk to her again, ask her about the Danny Rollins. I will, yeah, dude. Right, I will. Sure. Yeah, the yeah. old singing serial killer himself, <laughs> Gainesville Ripper. All right. So uh, next week, though, we're going to be doing a bonus episode since we're going to be at the Dark History Convention, and we're going to be doing the Hanging Coffins of China. Uh, definitely a really cool story that I stumbled on, and we're going to be doing that one next week. Uh, since we'll be busy uh, with the Dark History Convention. So, Joey, got any good page of days for us? Yeah, I got some page of day. Fucking, we're fucking doing this one fucking on the video. So, fucking. Yeah, Chris stepped out. Fla- do a, flash I him think up. he's got a piss. His bladder's the size of a grape <laughs> nut. So. You know how Chris is. Oh, yeah. he, he drinks a few. Just in case people are wondering what the hell happened, Chris <laughs> just gets up and walks out. That's how it goes. Here you don't see that when you're listening to the podcast. No, but now we but now got, that we got the video, we got proof, Joey. We got proof. <laughs> All right, so uh, we're going to talk about these page days. I got a few of them. Um, okay, <clears throat> the first one is about the murder of Angie Zapata. So Angie Zapata was just 18 years old when she was murdered by Alan Andrade on July 17, 2008. So Zapata met 31-year-old Andrade on the social networking site Moco Space, and the two met up at Zapata's Greenlee, Colorado apartment on July 15th. So they spent almost three days together before Andrade discovers that Zapata was actually a transgender. Oh! So when he learned her identity, he begins beating her first with his fists and then with a fire extinguisher. Uh, he cleaned up the scene, stole Zapata's car. When police picked him up two weeks later, he saw he said that he thought that he quote killed it. Oh, boy. Uh, at, 
at Andrade's trial, his defense lawyers repeatedly refused to call Angie by her name and frequently misgendered her. Then the jury heard a jailhouse recording of Andrade's conversation with a girlfriend in which he proclaimed, quote, gay things must die. So Zapata's family pushed prosecutors to pursue the hate crime charges, and on April 22, 2009, Andrade was found guilty on first-degree murder, hate crimes, aggravated motor vehicle theft, and identity theft. Uh, he was sentenced to life without the possibility of parole, plus 60 years due to six prior felonies. In this 2009 trial was the first to result in a hate crime conviction of crimes against a transgender person. Wow. That's uh, fucked up. Yeah. Okay, so <clears throat> the second one is about a cold case that was that ended up getting cracked. So on Halloween 1979, a woman's body was found in a culvert along I-35 in Georgetown, Texas. So she had been strangled and sexually assaulted. Her body was left entirely nude except for a pair of orange socks and a pearl stone ring. Uh, serial killer Henry Lee Lucas, he admitted to killing her, though this was later called into question because it came into light that he had read about the case before his confession. And we know how he right, was. Right, so, right. Um, That's orange in August socks. 2000, orange socks, yep. In August 2019, orange socks was identified as 23 year old Deborah Jackson. Uh, they did that through the DNA Doe Project and uh, they identified a potential cousin. But it was a re- it was a rendering of Jackson by a digital forensic artist that actually broke the case because whenever the image caught the eye of Jackson's sister, she contacted the authorities. Um, they identified her by some scars on her legs, her distinctly long toes, and unique earlobes. Uh, DNA was given by her sister to confirm the identity. They just thought that back then that she struck out on her own and they never even reported her missing. No shit. Wow. That's fucked yep. up. Uh, next one I got is about, uh, a blanket immunity law. This is pretty fucking weird. So in 2017 in New Hampshire, there was a law that accidentally gave blanket immunity to any pregnant women who committed second degree murder, manslaughter, negligent homicide, or caused an aided suicide. Uh, (laughs) they, they, they were defining a 20 week old fetus as a person, ostentatiously for the purposes of prosecuting the murders of pregnant women. So it's like if you murder a woman that's pregnant, then you're also then right. guilty for the fetus inside. Right, them. Right, so that, right. That's what the whole thing was. But they were complaining that the law could possibly criminalize women who were seeking abortion. So it was, you know, a whole political thing that was going on up there. Oh, yeah. So, so to appease the Democrats, the Republicans hastily changed the language unintentionally wording it so pregnant women could not be charged with homicide and could kill anyone with legal impunity. Um, (laughs) (laughs) Republican lawmaker J.R. Hull admitted that the bill is drafted allows for physician-assisted suicide and allows a pregnant woman to commit homicide without consequences. And although that was never the intent, that is the clear reading of the language. So the law was only on the books for one week before the legislature was able to clarify the language and you know grammar right, that was right. used it's like the fucking to, purge. to make it make sense it's like the purge going yeah out. for sure <laughs> it's like man thank god somebody didn't fucking figure that right? out at the wrong time god right? damn all right wow uh i got i got one more oh something else you know i was gonna bring up too um before i say this last one on page today was uh you guys know or people that listen know that i really like the the interviews and stuff well uh, Blue Dot Crime, I'm going to shout their name out because they're one of my favorite uh, inter- uh, interrogation fucking channels on YouTube, but they've started playing um, the Jeff fucking Palo uh, interrogations, which that's a case I want to do real bad on here, okay. but that's from Bloomington. He was a police sergeant in Bloomington that was a convicted yeah, yeah. serial rapist, right. but that dude was involved in all kinds of other shit. But anyway, I've never seen the interrogations with him, and that's what Blue Dot's doing now. They got that, and they got some witness interrogation oh, and stuff cool. like that. So it's been really cool. I was reading about that, and then we're doing the Gerard Schaefer, you know, another cop killer yeah. case. So uh, anyway, I just wanted to bring that up real fast. Very cool. But, um 
So uh, for page a day, this is going to be the last one, and this one's pretty cool. Uh, they're talking about uh, states with the highest number of serial killer victims. Oh, shit. All right. So, so leading off at number one, the state with the most serial killer victims uh, is California. And they have 1,628 as of 2020. Wow. And that's so, just uh, serial killer victims, right? Yeah. God damn. Yeah, dude. and they say... They say in the 1980s, one in five of all murders by serial killers occurred in California. God. That shows you how much serial killing was going on in the right. fucking state. God right? damn. Uh, so uh, the other ones in the top five, uh, number two is Texas with 893. Three is Florida with 845. Number four, represent Illinois with 629. <laughs> yeah. And then... Uh, the fifth one to top it off is New York with 628. Wow. That's fucking crazy to think that fucking Illinois, Illinois be- beats out yeah, New that York. Yeah, I was just going to say that. That's fucking nuts, dude. Yeah. That's Chicago. Chicago. I don't know. I mean, that's serial killers. I don't know how they fucking clarify that. Right, really, but, right. Uh, so, anyway, and then also they said states with the fewest serial killer victims. North Dakota and Vermont, both with 11 each. Hawaii and New Hampshire with 10 each. And South Dakota with 7. God damn. Wow. So, right. Fucking big changes there. Huge definitely. Changes. definitely. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, so that's Page a Day. So fucking thank you guys for talking, yeah. listening to Page that. Page a yeah. Day is good stuff for sure. All right, guys. Well, we have done our fair share of murder tonight. Hopefully our, our viewers on YouTube enjoyed watching us do this segment. And oh, I yeah. think it's time to crank up some metal. Drink beer. So, Joey, what the hell do we need to do? Let's get our medal Just because on. CK has passed on, he's not done educating the masses. CK will forever be the great metal motherfucker. We're here to stomp poser ass and eradicate the planet of their kind. CK has passed the torch to us, and we will forge the fuck on. In CK's name, we will bestow metal knowledge upon all of you. All right. The great metal motherfucker always. We're going to play tribute to him here doing the metal segment, of course. And Joey, Joey, we rotate who has the horns. And when it's your turn with the horns, it's you that gets to pick the topic. And it's your turn tonight. I know you don't have, physically don't have... (laughs) Goat horns. We were of course, just talking we, about it just now. We've got them here, but I know you're yeah. going to get some. So, but even though you don't physically have any horns, you're still doing the metal segment tonight. And who did you pick to do as your feature band? I'm, I'm doing a, I'm doing the feature on Embalmer from Cleveland, Ohio. Fuck yeah! But dude. Also, just so you guys can see, because fucking. Since we're on Zoom, me and you can see each other. Uh, we're doing the pop tarts because that's what we do during the metal segment. We eat pop tarts, but let me show you guys which ones I got right now. Grape! Holy shit! Oh wow! I've never <laughs> seen grape pop tarts. How are they? I, I ran upon I ran up on fucking Punky Brooks in the four one nine here, and he was like, "Bro, you ain't never had no grape pop tarts, homie." Oh and he man. Fucking, to go with he gave me the hookup drink. on his own private stash. Yes, <laughs> absolutely would go with the grape drink. Uh, That's awesome. Anyhow, yeah. But they are. They're really good, but I like fucking grape shit, though. Oh, wow. I would definitely dig on that. All right. So, get this last bite in my mouth real quick, and then I'll Hell fucking yeah. talk about Bomber. Fucking right. Hell yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely dig these guys. Like I said, we played with them. I don't know which year it was, but they were just absolutely killer. And really nice guys, too. I talked to them after the show. All right. So, like I said, we're talking fucking Embalmer from Cleveland, Ohio. Now, as Embalmer, they were formed in 1990, although their first live show was in 1989, and that was under the name Corpse Grinder. Nice. So they ended up changing their name out, you know, and, and started as a bomber. 
Uh, they had three demos that came out. Now, this band has, uh, it, like, the Ohio scene is definitely a revolving door of musicians, and this this band and Bomber has had so many different people in it that I'm not really going to focus too much on them. But okay. I will say on I, I will say on the first demo that uh, it was Scott Cunningham on guitars, uh, Toby Wolf on vocals and bass, Mark Davis on guitars, and Roy Stewart on drums. And of course, Mark Davis went on to stay with the band for quite a while. Uh, so when they came out, they had three demos that they put out. They had Into the Oven in 1991. Taxidermist in 1992 and Rotting Remains in 1993 and all of them were pretty badass demos and that led up to 1995 when they came out with the it, it's an EP but to me I mean it, it was just as big as an album but it was an EP uh, right. the album there was blood everywhere so fucking nice. good um, this EP was picked up uh, by Relapse Records and released as part of the Relapse single series too. So that's pretty cool. Fucking that, you know, a band like that fucking ended up there. Yeah. Um, so that was 1995. So go all the way to 2006, and that's whenever they they released their first full length. And uh, this was called Thirteen Faces of Death, and this came out on Pathos Records. What year was that? In 2000, 2006. Okay, I think that's the one so, I got. A long time after, yeah, a long time after the inception. Um, this band has been around, you know, in one form or another for a really, really long time, but only have a handful of albums out. And it, it's not necessarily a terrible thing because every one of them is a quality album, so I guess that says something. Right. Um, so so uh, in 2012... They came out with the collection of Carnage, which came out on Severed Records, and this was basically uh, most all their songs they had up to that point all re-recorded. In 2016, they came out with their second full length called Emanations from the Crypt. Uh, This is whenever they got Paul Gorfine on his vocals, and uh, he's been with them for a while, and then Brian Baxter joined uh, on guitars with the band. And Baxter, he's a really awesome guy. He's really big in the scene. And he does a label called the Bladed Records. Um, The the Emanations from the Crypt album, that came out on Hell's Headbangers Records. And in 2019, they released a live album called Embalmed Live, which also came out on Hell's Headbangers. Uh, All of these tracks were recorded live. All the way through, there was no studio magic, triggers, edits, or nothing like that. It was just a raw recording of them playing the songs live. That's which wicked. Which was really cool. Yeah, that's fucking wicked. So, I mean, that's pretty much it with a bomber. Like I said, they've been around a long time. They're a fucking staple of the fucking Midwest grind scene for sure. Uh, the work that those guys did back and forth with Illinois bands, you know, is fucking phenomenal and helped create you know the huge network that was going on and you know these guys are still out there Uh, i was just hanging out with brian at chicago domination fest he had his his uh ablated records um kiosk set up there so it's just cool he was also one of the first dudes that whenever i was moving out here to ohio was like bro yeah come out man we're doing stuff out here and he was very supportive of it so very cool uh, big ups to a bomber if you don't know about that band go listen to him fucking old death metal with a fucking touch of grind to it we'll end up playing one of the tracks uh but yeah a bomber cleveland ohio check it out very cool okay, dude man. awesome Hell man yeah. And then, uh, Chris, we always come up with a lost classic to, to chew on this week, and yeah. it's your turn. What did you pick? I got the 1995 four-song demo fucking Cut to Pieces by Sarcophagy. Fucking. Oh, yeah. That Fuck shit's yeah, fucking old-school death metal. Fucking love that shit. Remember getting that demo at fucking uh, Lafayette Club when they played there and shit? Just fucking just a dope-ass album, man. Oh like yeah, said, dude. Four, four songs, but still a nice fucking demo killer. too. Yeah. That's Sweet like demo, underground. Yeah. Yeah. Fucking love that shit. 
Very I cool. feel like that's the second time that you've used that as a lost classic, which is awesome. <laughs> is it really? And I bet you there. But that's awesome, though, and I bet you do it again at a later date. That's too. fucked hey, up. It, it's got to be that good <laughs> that it's worth repeating, right? Very Man, cool. yeah, fuck yeah. <laughs> okay. Awesome. Well, shit. Now, on a, on a sad note, I saw this yesterday. The uh, former singer of Grim Reaper, uh, the band from yeah. the U.K., Steve Grimmett, a uh, hell of a fucking singer, uh, he died yesterday. Uh, I'm not sure of the cause, if that's even been released, but... Uh, just an absolutely tremendous voice, and he was the one that sang their anthem from the 80s, See You in Hell, and there was a lot of people that had, I saw memes that said, you know, Steve Grimmett, See You in Hell, my friend, hell yeah. um, and uh, just a cool, you know, old school metal singer, um, but supposed to be a super good dude. He actually lost uh, half of his leg a few years ago and and been singing from a wheelchair kind of like jeff becerra so um you know kudos to that dude and and sad to see that he that he passed so all right what uh what's everybody been listening to lately chris i know you're a a a a very uh, cosmopolitan (laughs) kind of guy with a lot of tastes uh, in different genres but what have you been jamming lately i won't even uh, like a Always something different, but I've been listening to this fucking other podcast called fucking uh, uh, Music City 911. You're cheating on Murder Metal Man. Yeah, yeah, I am. I am. <laughs> but this, this dude's a 911 dispatcher, and he plays, and not just from his city or whatever, but from all over the place. He plays 911 calls, and it's fucking interesting as fuck to hear some oh, of these wow. 911 calls. They're fucking intense. A lot of them. Like, People watching murders happen, like active active shootings going on. The, hearing oh, the nine one one calls is crazy, but I listened to one today that I just wanted to mention real quick. This motherfucking dude, he fucking it, it, he didn't actually call nine one one on this one. He called the sheriff's office, and he's bitching at this cop. He's like, "I was in a hotel last night. These fucking cops came to my house and stole my weed from my wife. Fucking, I want my fucking <laughs> weed back. Fucking, it was only four grams, but it was fucking really good weed. I don't know what the fuck's going on. And, and it's just fucking hilarious. Listen, to this guy bitching at this cop because cops stole his weed in a place where it's not legal. So like, right. <laughs> it's fucking hilarious." So, that's yeah. cool though cool. <laughs> but yeah I, I, different podcasts and different music but yeah, the fucking nine the music city 911 is like holy fuck dude that's cool like hearing as the shit's going down yeah that's pretty interesting joey what about you man uh over there in the 419 what you been jamming you uh, i was punky? listening to uh yeah for sure um uh, the anniversary of Internal Bleeding, Driven to Conquer, just passed, so I was jamming that. Um, I was listening to uh, Cephalic Carnage, Conforming to Abnormality, and uh, I was listening to uh, some I Hate God in the Name of Suffering. So, jamming a little bit of different shit. That's cool. Last That's night cool. I was listening to the new uh, Cranium Split with... Uh... I think that's a new one. Derek was playing it last night. I don't remember what it was, but it was fucking dope. That's cool. I've been jamming oh, some yeah. Hell Drifter. I did the review of their Lord of Damnation album. I haven't published it yet, only because I like to run it past the band first to make sure I didn't spell anybody's name wrong or anything that's factually wrong. Um, I'm waiting for them to give it back. But uh, but yeah, I've been jamming the hell out of that Lord of Damnation album i saw we had a couple listeners posting hey i really like hell drifter on the facebook page so that's really cool giving those guys a listen and um i'm going to be doing an interview with their singer billy uh we haven't worked out the date yet but that'll probably be my next feature if i can get it done in time uh which i think i can because we get the bonus next week so my next turn will be uh a couple weeks so i i think i can I could pull it together by then. I've also, like you, Chris, been listening to some podcasts lately, mostly on Elizabeth Bathory. I've been doing some research on her. Uh, I know we've talked about doing an episode with her, so that's a for sure. But um, I'm also working on a short story idea where a fictitious uh, prison guard 
carries on a, a conversations with her and she talks about her crimes and uh, working that into a, a a short story that's fiction but with real life characters like Elizabeth Bathory. So so I've been jamming some of that and listening to some pretty good stuff and there's a lot of different uh, theories about her maybe that she didn't do any of the things they claim she did that maybe she was framed to put her in prison to get her money which would not totally surprise me uh in the way of you know the 1600s and all the crazy shit that happened with fortunes and kings and queens and just all that kind of shit right. game of thrones style stuff so uh so yeah so that's what i've been listening to uh, bands, if you're in a band and you want to get a hold of us to let us play your music, uh, you can contact us at Pete at MurderMetalMayhem.com. No guarantee we're going to play it, but we'll check it out. And if we like it, we'll get a hold of you. Maybe we'll do an interview. Maybe we'll do a review. Or maybe we'll have you on the show. Uh, but uh, uh, if you want to send it old school, you can send it to Murder Metal Mayhem, P.O. Box 554. Hayworth, Illinois, 61745. And if you want to throw in a sticker or two, and, you know, hey, throw in a box of Pop-Tarts, that's not going to hurt, all right? Listeners need to step up your Pop-Tart game here because that's what we like to eat when we're doing our metal segment. So uh, now, Chris, you got the horns next. Well, Any idea you what you're going to be doing? You do. Or I do. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I do. Uh, sorry, Chris. I probably freaked you out. Like, oh, my God, no. No, yes, it's my turn next. I think I'm doing Hell Drifter. Uh, if I can get the interview done before, then, uh, then yeah, it'll be me. Uh, also, guys, our 666 Club, a way that people can support the show. Uh, patreon.com slash murder metal mayhem three bucks a month get some bonus content get the shows a day early you get uh, merchandise discounts and all that so i'm hoping chris we see some 666 clubbers at, at the, the dark convention, history convention yeah. and all the listeners we're gonna have cck there so you can get your picture taken with cck if you want he looks so real that people will be so envious when you put that on your Facebook page. Like, man, you got a picture with C fucking K, Metal Blade fucking shirt on, throwing the horns up. So come on by the table. And uh, also, though, in the episode description will be a link if you want to do that and support the show. Just three bucks a month. All right. Well, we have done plenty of metal tonight. So, Chris, what the fuck do we need to do? Let's get our cannibalistic mayhem on. Is your love life getting you down? Are you tired of beating your meat to the same old videos on Pornhub? Well, come on and take a trip with the sick rip of and rides and find out what love is really about in the back of my filthy rape van. My girlfriend and I took a ride on sick rip of van rides, and it was awesome. She got chained up and raped in the back of the van. While I ate McDonald's in the passenger seat. <laughs> Sick Ripper even shot some video for us to have a lasting memory of the whole day. Thanks. Sick Ripper! Yeah, take a ride in white trash style with Sick Ripper Van Rides! 
smoke some crack with the girls, a hawthorn and strangle one with me. We'll plant that bitch in my special garden. Fuck yeah! It was so wonderful. Hunting a dead prostitute in Sick River's garden. It felt so good to recycle. Let the like, cycle of life spread its wings. Yay! Woo! Just open up your window and scream out, Sick Ripper! Today and I'll be there to pick you up for a ride you'll never forget. Now! Sick Ripper! Oh my god. <laughs> Loving the Sick Ripper. The original Sick Ripper commercial. That was fucking awesome. Oh, the OG, and before that, Joey, some embalmer, necrofiling cabinet. That uh, was fucking special. And <laughs> I, I love that name. Such a good name for a song. That it is, is a, a good is a one. Good and those guys are fucking old school Cleveland band, so very cool. Joey, good segment on them for sure. And oh, hopefully yeah. we got some embalmer fans now checking out some Murder Metal Mayhem. So if that's the case, welcome aboard. And love to have you guys on here. Now, we are in our Mayhem segment, but none of the three of us has a Mayhem story tonight to tell, but that's okay. We're at like an hour and 45 on this episode, and we've got still more to go. So we're going to keep rolling, and we're going to go into our probably the, the fan favorite of the show, the Killer Cage Match. <laughs> that's when we have a list of 75 killers, 75 objects they can fight with, and a list of 15 variables, and we get our listeners to give us the random numbers so we know who's fighting and what they're fighting with. And Chris, who do we want to say thank you to? We got Missy Hartson, Dan Jude, and Laura Kovacs. Hell yeah. Fuck yeah. Very cool. And uh, Dan Jude, that is Brother Dan from Hate Choir. Um, if you guys uh, remember that band from back in the day, Central Illinois yeah. uh, band. Uh, Dan's a good dude, and so cool to see him on here. All right, oh, yeah. well, Joey, we got a good matchup tonight in the cage, or maybe not. I don't know. It's interesting. Uh, what do we got going on tonight? Fucking <clears throat> Jeffrey Dahmer, and he's going to fucking go up against Joe Matheny. Oh, boy. Yeah, yeah that, that that is a definite task. That's a hoss of a dude. To handle Joe Matheny. <laughs> Can you imagine how long it would take Jeffrey Dahmer to eat Joe Matheny? <laughs> oh, wow. my God, dude. <laughs> He'd be a prepper, man. That'd be like fucking months, months, probably years. God damn. He'd have to freeze some of it, you know. Oh, for sure. Leftovers, you know, that whole thing. He, he, would, he needs a bigger deep freeze. Yeah, that's for sure. That's for sure. <laughs> All right, so we got uh, Jeffrey Dahmer and Joe Matheny. And Chris, what are the two objects these guys are going to be fighting with? Oh, tonight they have a fucking chainsaw. Ooh. And some dental floss. A roll of dental (laughs) floss. I don't know what the fuck that's going to do. Or is it used dental floss? I mean, I I don't know. We'll just go with a roll of dental floss. Okay. All right. And uh, Joey, who, what is the variable they're going to have in the cage with them? Uh, they got Corpse Grinder from Cannibal Corpse, not Corpse Grinder, the band. I know. I was right, going right. to say, what an odd coincidence that is. <laughs> so, That's great. So we got Corpse Grinder after drinking a fifth of McCormick's whiskey at the Nation. Oh, boy. Okay. Ugh, I don't uh, know how he holds his alcohol, but that could make for an interesting night. So we got Jeffrey Dahmer and Joe Matheny going at it in the cage with a chainsaw, some dental floss, and Corpse Grinder is running around in there with his fucking thick-ass neck after drinking a fifth of McCormick's whiskey at the Nation. Chris, what in the fuck do we even do with this one, man? Uh, I'm going to go like, first of all, Corpse Grinder fucking got a fifth of whiskey at the Nation. We all just going to sit around and watch the show all together. Like, let's see what happens with this <laughs> shit right here. Of course, kind of just sitting back with all of us. We got some metal jamming in the back, fucking drinking whiskey. Like, fuck yeah. So then uh, you get uh, Matheny out there, and he's fucking huge, dude. He's a fucking mountain of a man compared right. to Jeffrey Dahmer. Right. So, like, 
He just gonna he just gonna grab Dahmer, bear hug the shit out of him, and just crush him. Fucking use the fucking chainsaw to chop him up and fucking grind him up, and use a dental floss to fucking tie him up to throw on the smoker like he's a fucking pork roast. Oh fucking wow! Throw him on the pork roast. Throw him on the smoker. Fucking nation corpse grinder Matheny. We're gonna sit around the nation and eat Jeffrey Dahmer. Oh wow! Okay, <laughs> all right. No barbecue uh, yeah. sandwiches. No, nope. no. Nope. All, right. all right. Very cool. Very cool. Joey, what do you think about this one, man? Does Dahmer stand uh, a chance? I don't know how much Matheny weighed at the at the height of all this, but I'm going <laughs> to guess like four something, maybe five. I mean, he was fucking humongous. Yeah. Uh, so my variation of the uh, Killer Cage match this week, uh, when that bell rings, fucking Jeffrey Dahmer, he's just fucking running, juking, fucking sliding around <laughs> Joe Matheny because he's fucking way too quick for him. <laughs> Joe Matheny, Joe Matheny takes about three or four fucking grabs at Dahmer and he's so fucking winded and tired out that he just fucking falls on the ground and fucking has to take a fucking nap because he has the itis from all them ribs he was eating. <laughs> so fucking Jeffrey Dahmer sees that as his opportunity, fucking corpse grinder. He drank a fifth of whiskey at the fucking nation. He's already passed out over in the corner he's not even watching the show <laughs> oh, okay. so fucking jeffrey dahmer grabs that fucking that fifth bottle off him and fucking smashes it fucking takes the fucking top part of the bottle shoves it into joe Matheny's head and tries to fucking lobotomize him he can't fucking figure out how to do it because he can't find no brain in that fool's fucking head. <laughs> so he says, fuck it. He says, fuck it. And he grabs that fucking dental floss and he fucking digs around until he finds the little penis that's hiding in Joe Matheny's fat fucking rolls. <laughs> oh, pulls it man. out with the dental floss and fucking ties it up and fucking chops it off and he gets some little two inch souvenir of Joe Matheny. <laughs> then he grabs that then he grabs that chainsaw and he fucking cuts Joe Matheny's neck off, goes over and cuts Corpse Grinder's neck off, and he has him a double ass neck sandwich. God fucking damn. Jeffrey Dahmer wins. Oh All wow. right. <laughs> yeah. That was that was that was interesting. All right. That's for sure. I like that. Very cool. I I like that a lot. Double neck sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> It's, it's next level. Yeah. It's who, next level. <laughs> Fuck off. Who has a thicker neck, Joe Matheny or Corpse Grinder, man? Dude, I don't Ooh, know. Jesus. <laughs> That's brutal. All At right. least, uh, I mean, uh, Corpse Grinder is there, prevalent. Like, Matheny's is kind of shorter. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. All right. Well, very cool. Love doing some Killer Cage match. All right, my book, Deeper Than Dead, is out now. It came out in June, so you can get a copy. Go to deeperthandead.com and order yours today. And I've been cranking out a lot of short stories lately, getting ready for the next creation of chaos. And I'm about ready to start the next novel here in the next couple of weeks. So I'm excited about that. It's going to take me a while, but uh, the only way to do it is writing one page at a time. So that's got to start at some point. Also, we've mentioned this before. Do not forget to come and see us at the Dark History and Horror Convention this weekend. Coming out the day after this episode drops, Friday, August 19th. That's 2022. From uh, 4 to 8 p.m. And then Saturday, August 20th, from 10 a.m. to 7 p.m. Um, it's at the I Hotel in Champaign, Illinois. And I'll link to it in the episode description if you want to get your tickets. They got all kinds of actors, authors, movie producers, podcasters. And a lot of other shit. A lot of shit going on. Tattooing. I mean, all sorts of shows. Movie screenings. I mean, it's going to be wild. I don't know how I'm not going to go broke buying shit at this thing, but I'm going to try <laughs> to resist and just buy maybe a couple cool things. Um, but we're going to have our table there so the murder metal mayhem table will be up we're gonna have cck with us brian usual the artist that's uh, done the deeper than dead stuff he's gonna be there signing copies with me chris you're gonna be there i mean it's yeah. gonna be a lot of fun it'll be a good time it so, always is yeah so don't forget that uh come out one of the days both the days get your picture taken with cck um and just come on and say hi 
All right, the YouTube channel. We got this video from tonight that we did the murder segment on. Uh, be you'll up. be able to see us talking about this shit and oh, yeah. uh, Brady Bunch style on Zoom. So go subscribe <laughs> to that YouTube channel. I link to that in the episode description to make it real easy for you. All right, well, I think we have done plenty of mayhem tonight. So I think it's time to hit the outro. This strange behavior grew Gary Brittles had a fascination Women took their garments and shoes Gary Brittles was a foot fetish killer Kept her in his foot inside his freezer Rested up for deals and he'd be gone Gary Brittles Gary Brittles The one and only Macabre and Chris, that was killer foot fetish. Yes, sir. Jerry Brutos. Jerry oh, Brutos! <laughs> <laughs> I think hearing Rick Fisher talk about those guys made me want to throw in that track tonight. So Hell yeah. Fuck yeah. yeah. All right, Joey, who is our bumper music tonight? Uh, tonight we heard Macabre, Cut Up, and Fucking Embalmer. Hell yeah, dude. Hell yeah. Uh, the metal segment intro music, Chris, by who? Fucking Cry Six, yeah. You know it. And the Murder Metal Mayhem intro music by Low Fucking Twelve. Uh, again, one last time, don't forget to come see us this weekend at the Dark History and Horror Convention, uh, Friday, August 19th, that's 2022, and Saturday, August 20th, all the details uh, in the episode description, links, it's at the I Hotel in Champaign, Illinois, so come by and see us, and it'll be a lot of fun. All right, thanks to everybody out there listening. We keep seeing those numbers rolling in. We appreciate everyone out there checking the show out. Fuck yes, we do. Telling your friends, your grandma, your Aunt Mabel, whatever the fuck you got to do. Chris, we want to read some comments, and what's that first one there, dude? The first one we got here is Cindy Rogers 34 says, You guys are the shit. I've been listening for a year. I love it. I really like the Joe Naso episode. That was fucked up, and yes, it was. Yeah, that's for sure. Thank Definitely you for very fucked Cindy. up. Yeah, thanks, Cindy. What about the second one there, Joey? Uh, David the Crusher sixty nine said, "I love when you guys have text on that Birdman episode was great. Thank you. We love having text. Hell yes, yeah, definitely love having text on the show. That's for sure. Very cool. The third one here, Carla Killer Clowns commented. Wow, that's a lot of whoop whoop. That's a lot whoop, of cuz. <laughs> nice." Uh, <laughs> I'm in El Paso, Texas, and I really love hearing you guys every week. My husband and I love the killer cage matches the best. Well, thanks, yeah, Carl. I'm glad you guys like, like that. that. I thought tonight's was a good one, that's for sure. Hell yeah, Anytime was. Joe Matheny's in the cage, it's going to be a good one. <laughs> yeah. Going to get Hell crazy. Yeah. All right, and that last one, Chris. We got uh, Michaela Griggs says, Pete, I really love your books. I bought Deeper Than Dead last month and just finished it. It was so good. I also love the podcast, Hornside from Rochester, New York. Hell yeah, home of the Joe Naso, uh, where Joe Naso was born. Yeah. <laughs> Not the Alphabet Killer, but Joe Naso, right? Uh, SickRickMasks.com, that's S-I-K-R-I-K Masks.com. Go check it out. Great website, tons of cool stuff. Uh, his stuff, the trick-or-treat masks. He's got some of the coolest serial killer masks. We've got nine of them here, and we love talking about them. And we've got the feature mask this week, Chris. Some yes, Ted, Bundy. Ted Bundy. Got the headphones on over there chilling. And uh, it's fun to, to bring the masks on the table and talk about the different ones we've got. Because, like I said, we've got nine of these things in here. But Sick Rick, thanks for supporting the show. Uh, my book, Deeper Than Dead, you can go to deeperthandead.com and pick up a copy. I've got it in color. I've got it black and white. I've got posters. Got some cool shit. Uh, and we'll have those at the Dark History Convention. So come on by. Uh, also, check out the uh, murdermetalmayhem.com to listen to the past episodes. And also, we're going to have our activity book there, Chris. We're going to have some of those. I ordered a whole stack of them. So you guys come out. 
Got some Murder Metal Mayhem stickers. And we do need to work on new ones of those. We do. We do. It was on something we wanted to do after the summer. We talked yeah, about yeah, once yeah. Joey got settled in. That's so right. we're going to do another was. activity book for sure. And we'll have Joey oh, do yeah. all the artwork this time. So that'll be awesome. And then, Joey, speaking of you, what about your distro? What's <clears throat> what's the latest? Uh-oh. Uh, FTA Records is still here. Records with a Z. Go to Facebook. Check it out. Message me if you need something. Um, since I got all my fucking uh, shit moved over here to Ohio, I'll be getting back into recording my uh, my Gormonger, my third Horrorflix album, which fucking... I've got all the songs ready to go. I just need to record guitars and vocals on it. But uh, it didn't happen before I moved, so... Yeah, that, that's what's up next for me. It happens, but I link to Joey's distro in the episode description so you yeah. guys can get at it that way. Also, I'll have my distro at Full Terror, which I'm playing, which I'll be at in a few weeks. That's so right. It's coming up soon. That's yeah. right. I definitely want to talk about that next episode. We do uh, kind Hell of a yeah. little preview of the Full Terror Assault lineup and stuff and that you'll be playing there, Joey. That's really cool. All right, yeah. you can like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Uh, you can check us out on most of the podcast platforms that are out there. We mentioned that 666 Club. That's a way you can support the show. Patreon.com slash Murder Metal Mayhem. But we can't let him go without hearing a karaoke song. This is one I did that's definitely fitting for this piece of shit, Gerard Schaefer. So crank this one up. And until next time, keep one foot in the gutter. And I'm going to keep this fist wrapped around this beer. Sounds like a plan. <laughs> See the size of the flame, dwelling on the past, burning up my brain. Everyone that burns to learn from the pain. Hey, I think about the day my girl ran away with my pay when the fellas get to play. Now she's stuck with my homies and she fucked. I'm a sucker with the lump in my throat. Hey, like a chump, I'm like a chump, like a chump, like a chump, I'm like a chump, like a chump, like a chump. Should I be feeling bad? Should I be feeling good? It's kind of sad. I'm the life and talk of the neighborhood. And you would think I'd be moving on. But I'm a sucker, like I said. Fucked up in the head, not. Maybe she just made a mistake and I should give her a break. My heart will ache either way. Hey, what the hell you want me to say? I won't lie, that I can't deny. I did it all for the nookie. The nookie. So you can take the cookie. Sing it up yard. Sing it up yard. Sing it up yard. Sing it up yard. I did it all for the nookie, the nookie. You can take the cookie and stick it up your, stick it up your, stick it up your, stick it up your ass. Why did it take so long? Why did I wait so long, huh? To figure it out, but I did it, and I'm the only one underneath the sun who didn't get it. I can't believe that I could be deceived by my so-called girl, but in reality, had a hidden agenda. She put my tender heart in a blender till I surrendered. Hey, like a chump, I'm like a chump, like a chump, like a chump, I'm like a chump, like a chump, like a chump. I did it all for the nookie, the nookie, so you can take the cookie, sing it up your, sing it up your, sing it up your, sing it up your. I did it all for the nookie, the nookie, so you can take the cookie, sing it up your, sing it up your, sing it up your, sing it up your ass. I'm only human. It's so easy for your friends. Give you their advice They'll just tell you Just let it go It's easier said than done I appreciate it I do But Just fucking leave me alone Leave me the fuck alone Leave me alone it's gonna change, and you can't go away, and I'm just gonna stay here and always be the same, and nothing's gonna change, cause you can't go away, and I'm just gonna stay here and always be the same, and nothing's gonna change, cause you can't go away, and nothing's gonna stay here and always be the same, I did it all for
Shake it up your heart, shake it up your heart, shake it up your heart, shake it up your heart. I did it all for the new game, the new game. See you can take that cookie and shake it up your heart, shake it up your heart, shake it up your heart, shake it up your, shake it up your ass, bitch. This one goes out to my buddy, Pizza Radovich, the biggest Limp Biscuit fan on the face of the fucking earth. Love you, brother. Thank you.